Hello and welcome to EE333. I'm your instructor, Gregory Myers. In this video, we're going to start a new series focusing on our inheritance demo. This is the first video in that series. And in this video, we're going to go through setting up our inheritance driver, as well as some of the Java classes that we are going to be using throughout this series. This video assumes that you have watched the fundamentals demo, you know how to set up your main, and you'll notice that I've already provided us with some code, particularly the code that would allow for us to simply enumerate through each one of our arguments that are passed when we launch our Java main class. Additionally, you'll see that I have set up our if statement to triage the subsequent switches that will come after the Java class name, as well as the help that will be called in the event that we do not successfully handle a switch. Basically, in this case, if the user either wants help or they don't understand how to use our application. So let's take a quick look at what our plan is for this series. And to start that, we want to take a look at this class hierarchy diagram that I have created. This was created as part of a group discussion with the students in my class, and I've attempted to capture essentially what was their thoughts on how to model a system, a human resources system of sorts, that would cover a system that handles both employees, students, patients, and volunteers. So imagine if you would, uh, you're part of a university that also has a hospital associated with it. What kind of entities would you expect to find in the system if you were to try to encompass all of these different types of roles? So what we're going to do in this particular example is we're going to set up the basic structure of this inheritance demo. Specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to set up all of the classes associated with these users, employees, student, patient, and volunteer roles, as well as the subclasses. Also note that down here on the bottom right, I have an additional class called address that currently doesn't really fit into our diagram. We'll talk more about that in subsequent videos, as well as you notice that I have an enumeration listed um, that we're going to refer to as our status that will indicate whether a entity is active, inactive, or unknown. Now, this particular document is not intended to be static. As a matter of fact, we would hope that it would grow and evolve and be easily modified as we build our project. The whole goal of a good object-oriented design is for it to be accurate in its model of the real-world system in this case, but also should be flexible enough to adapt to change. So currently, I have none of the fields or methods listed. We will come back to modify these as we go along. So what I would encourage you to do is to bounce back and forth between our NetBeans project and our draw.io document and update them as we go along. Later on, we'll take a look at some tools that will help facilitate this. So at this point, you probably want to take a quick screen capture and get started on your own draw.io and what we'll do now is we're going to jump over to NetBeans and we're going to start working with these classes that we've already identified as major entities in our project. So how did we come up with that list of classes? Well, we basically ask ourselves the question, where will additional attributes or information or possibly just in general features need to be added to an existing class? And once again, this is not an exact science necessarily, but basically what we would do is if there was enough justification for that flexibility, then we would want to create a subclass. For instance, you 
could probably agree that an employee and a student are significantly different, or perhaps a student and a patient are significantly different. However, the employee, the student, and the patient also have certain things in common. For example, they probably all have first and last names, as well as some unique identifier that allows for them to be tracked through the system. Essentially, what we're going to do here is we're going to leverage that natural relationship between these entities, and we are going to build the classes and put the properties and the behavior in the most logical class. In other words, the one that probably has the closest association with that functionality. So to begin with, what I wanna do is I simply wanna go ahead and create a new Java class and we're gonna start off at the top of that diagram and we're gonna simply start with our user. And we'll click finish. We're not gonna do anything to our user yet. What we're going to do first is just simply set up the entire structure. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna focus on that next tier or those four entities, the employee, student, patient, and then volunteer. And we're going to start off with the employee. And for the employee to be able to indicate then that the employee actually inherits from the user, we simply specify that it extends our user class. And we are going to be explicit in our package name here. So in this case, ee333.user. Now, you can go ahead and take a second while we're at it to clean this code up. We would obviously want to come back and add some documentation later on, but we are not going to cover that in this video. We're just simply going to focus on our structure. Likewise, we want to go ahead and create a new student class and our student class also will inherit from our user. So in this case, it's going to extends the E333 dot user. We'll have a new patient class. that also extends from our user. And then lastly, the volunteer. There we go. Okay, so what we've accomplished so far is essentially setting up the structure for these first two tiers. Now what we'd like to do is we'd like to spend a little bit of time at least setting up the structure for these additional subclasses. Now if you notice the way that I've been going about doing this is I've been creating a separate Java file for each class. And if we come back in here, we'll start with our user. We set up a public class inside of that user.java. If we attempt to add, for instance, in our employee class, our subclasses by specifying the public keyword, and we'll focus now on our university employee, And we'll say that it also extends our EE333, but in this case, not the user, but the employee, you'll get a warning that says, if it's a, going to be a public class, it should be declared in a file with the matching name. 
Now, we could go about doing this. However, that would result in a significant number of files. And for this particular demo, there is really no need for that. So rather what we're going to do is we're simply going to eliminate the public keyword and we'll discuss the ramifications of that later and simply leave this as class university employee. And it simply extends our EE333.employee. Your first comment should be, or your first thought rather should be, why does it not directly extend the EE333 user? Or if you go back to your diagram, why wouldn't we go from the university employee directly to the user? Well, the idea here is that as you go down your hierarchy diagram, you essentially add additional attributes or functionality to your classes. So the idea is that the subclass should be more refined. In other words, it perhaps is a little more descriptive, has additional functionality. That is a generality. It is, however, typically the practice when it comes to creating subclasses. You would want to have a reason for creating a subclass, perhaps to add additional attributes or add additional functionality. Therefore, we would want the university employee to inherit from the employee and pick up any additional attributes or methods that are associated with that employee. The employee would ultimately get some of its attributes and its functionality from our user class. Likewise, our hospital employee, which is assumed to have slightly different functionality than the university employee, would not want to get the university employee's functionality, but would only want to get the functionality associated with the employee and any of functionality that it might pick up from our user. So once again, let's go back to NetBeans, and then let's go ahead and identify how our hospital employee class is going to be set up. So in this case, we have a class hospital employee and it will extend our EE333 dot employee as well. Which brings us now to the classes or the subclasses below both of these. And so it doesn't really matter where we start but in this particular case, what we want to do is we'll start over here on the left and we'll kind of work our way to the right. We are going to have our faculty inherit from our university employee and our staff will also inherit from our university employee. And on the hospital side, our nurse and our doctor will inherit from the hospital employee. And in both cases, they will pick up additional functionality from their parent class. So a doctor would essentially pick up functionality from the hospital employee, the hospital employee would pick up functionality from the employee and so on up to the ultimate parent class. And so at this point then, hopefully you're starting to see the pattern. We'll say a class faculty. And in this case, what we wanna have happen is it will extend our EE333 dot. And in this case, since their faculty is going to be on the university side, that will be a university employee. And likewise, our staff will extend our EE333 dot university employee. And on the hospital side, we want to have a doctor that will extend EE333 dot hospital employee and likewise the nurse extends our EE333 dot hospital employee. Now hopefully you can start to see the pattern in creating our structure. So what we'll do here is we will continue moving from left to right. 
we're now going to look at the student class and the subclasses associated with it are going to be graduate and undergraduate. Likewise with the patient, there will be inpatient and outpatient. And then we'll pick up these additional items in just a minute. Once again, back to net means. And we'll go over to the student class. In this case, our class will start off with our undergraduate students. And this is going to extend our EE 333 dot student class. and also the graduate class is going to extend our EE 333 student. Similarly, with our patient class, we're going to have an inpatient and an outpatient. So in this case, class, Inpatient and this is going to extend our patient class and our outpatient will extend our patient as well. Fortunately, for our sake, our volunteer doesn't have any subclasses. It might in the future, but for right now, we're going to leave that one alone. What we want to do now is we want to take a look at this other class in this enumerator that we have left hanging out here. We once again will pick up and we will improve some of the functionality in our address class later. But what we want to do is have our address class be a separate standalone class that we're simply going to call address. We're going to leave it in the package EE333. And then we will add additional functionality in our subclasses. And then the last thing that we want to add before we start getting into the details is going to be our enumeration here, the status. So what you want to do now is you want to decide where would you like to store that enumerator. One suggestion that I would have for you is that you store it in the class that it is most closely tied to. And for the beginning here, what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the user class. And so in this particular case, we could justify having our enum status being associated with our user.java. And as we said in just in the um, UML, that for our status, we're going to have an active, an inactive, and an unknown. And we'll come back to why we will utilize the unknown as well as potentially other enumerators in a later video. So at this point, we have our structure for our project, at least as it stands as of right now, based on our UML. We are now at the point where we need to start thinking about some of the functionality in our classes. And to begin with, we'll start off with the attributes associated with some of our classes. Now, we're not going to go through all of these subclasses in this video. As a matter of fact, that's part of the evolution of this project is to identify where we would place new functionality. And if you want to think of functionality as features associated with the class that may be attributes or behavior, in other words, methods, as well as what you'll see is that we can control some of the behavior through our constructors. <clears throat> Essentially what we want to do is look at the top of our hierarchy and identify what things are in common with our first tier, those four 
subclasses. So in this case, we would agree that an employee, a student, a patient, and a volunteer all probably have some sort of ID so that we can track them through the system, a first name, a last name, and some sort of address, especially in the case of the employee and the student, and definitely in the case of the patient, perhaps with the volunteer that might initially seem not as relevant. However, we would like to be able to track our volunteers, for instance, to be able to notify them of events and so on. So essentially, you would agree that there are some commonality with all four of our main subclasses. However, an employee is going to typically and hopefully get paid. So the idea is that they might have a salary associated with them, whereas a student, for instance, might have courses associated with them. A patient might have some sort of records associated with them. And once again, we're gonna leave the volunteer alone for right now, and we'll see what additional functionality we can add to them. Instead, what we wanna do is we wanna focus right now on our employee and on our student classes. And we really have three questions that we wanna ask ourselves. One, what kind of attributes are associated with the class? Two, what kind of behavior is associated with that class? And then number three is how are we going to construct an instance of that class? So if we look at those three questions, let's start off with our attributes first. We're gonna put some key attributes in our user class that can then be used by all of its subclasses. And then we'll start by adding additional attributes to the employee and also to the student subclasses. Once again, let's come back to NetBeans. This time, let's focus on our user.java. And what we wanna do is we wanna look at what items or what attributes are associated with our user that we would expect to be essentially universal. And the first one that we can think of is probably going to be an ID. So in this case, I'm going to make it a string. We are not going to initialize it. We're just simply going to declare it. We're also going to have a private string first name, private string last name. And then we also said that we wanted to have some sort of address information. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create another private variable that is of address class, and more specifically, we would like to emphasize that it will be an EE333 address. And we're simply gonna call this one our primary address. Now, at this point, we could generate our getters and setters manually. But if you right click on your user class, if you're using NetBeans, and you go to refactor, you'll see that there are some tools in NetBeans that will allow for you to automatically encapsulate the fields. And what we want to do now is we want to think about which fields do we want the other classes or other functions in our application to be able to get or set information in our user. And so what we would like to be able to do, for instance, is see our ID, but not necessarily modify it once the user has been created. The first name and last name may be examples of fields that we are okay with modifying after the user gets created. For instance, someone may get married or maybe when the user object was created, there was a typo in one of the fields. So first name, last name, and definitely our address may be examples of things that we could modify after the fact. Now, we're gonna revisit the address because we're gonna work on the behavior of the address in the address class. 
But what we'll do for right now is we're going to go ahead and choose which one of these fields get have a getter and which ones have a setter. So to begin with, I'm going to go ahead and select all, and then I'm going to allow a get for my ID, but I am not going to allow for a set for my ID, as well as I'm going to go ahead and make the argument that I do not want to be able to set my primary address. This is going to seem a little strange initially, but we're gonna come back and revisit this one. At this point, we can go ahead and hit refactor, and you'll see that NetBeans auto-generates all of the getters and setters. Particularly, you'll notice that the setters have a void function return, and the getters will simply have the data type of the underlying private variable. Note also that by default with the NetBeans template for this, we do not use the this keyword, nor do we use the parentheses after the return around the returned variable. Also note that there is no validation here. So for instance, if we have our set first name method or setter that accepts a first name, you would want to add some additional functionality here that would check to see, for instance, if first name is null, if first name has a zero length, or if it has characters that would not otherwise qualify in a first name. So just a little note is that everywhere you have a setter, you need to include validation. And so I'm going to leave this here just as a general blanket term or blanket comment rather, that we will cover later on, but just be aware that you need to do it. So everywhere there's a setter, you want to make sure and include some sort of validation. Now, the last field that we did not include was the status. And basically what we want to do is we want to use this as somewhat of a system status to tell the status of our user object. And this is going to get blurred a little bit. This distinction between the system status and in this case, perhaps the user status as an employee or a student, we might want to consider having multiple enumerators. But for this example, we're going to keep it simple in that we simply keep track of the status of the user in our system. And we will make that a PE333.status enum. And once again, lowercase status. Now, at this point, we can also go ahead and create a additional getter and a setter. And this might be one of those that we would be okay with modifying after the construction of the object. So for right now, we're going to have this essentially be both read and write, like refactor and you'll see that we have our additional fields here. Excuse me, our additional methods. Now, under the set status, we would also want to include some sort of validation, but this is one of the benefits of using an enum, because if you have code that calls this set status, it is going to be very difficult for you to pass a value that is not already the correct type. Once again, hopefully you see the benefits of now specifically using a status enum as opposed to just an integer value or even a string value for controlling the status. We will in fact come back to this. The last thing to note here is that under the setters, I am using the this keyword. This indicates that the status or the last name or the first name that I'm referring to is associated with a particular instance of the object. So in other words, I am changing the status of this object. Likewise, I am changing the status, excuse me, the last name of this object. Now, 
Continuing on, I said that we were going to address three things. The first thing that we wanted to address were the attributes of our class. The second thing that we would like to look at is some of the functionality. And so we're going to start with our two string methods. And so just a reminder here that we already get a two string by virtue of inheriting from the java.lang.object. But that might not be satisfactory. As a matter of fact, typically it isn't. So what we would like to do instead is we would like to create our own two string method for our user class. And in this case, we want it to be public. We want it to return a string and we are going to follow the same pattern that Java does. In this case, it's going to be a two string capital, oh, excuse me, lowercase t, capital S. And <clears throat> then the idea here is that we are going to return a custom string to describe our user object. To accomplish this, we're going to initialize a new temporary variable that we're going to call output. And we're simply going to use the shorthand notation here of setting it equal to empty quotes. And this initializes a string without using that constructor, the new constructor. And then lastly, we want to make sure before we go any further to simply return the output. So at this point, this function does absolutely nothing other than simply return an empty string. What we would like to do is we would like to craft a output that reflects the information that we wish to expose about our user. And so we'll start off with these basic fields first and we'll come back to the address in just a minute. We'd like to expose the ID or rather print out the ID, the first name and last name. So what I would encourage you to do is to come up with a nice structure. Now, I typically use a table here, but using the output variable, we'll start off with the ID field. And once again, it's up to you how you wanna make this look. And we include the this.id. And then at that point, then you can decide if you want to have each one of the items on a separate line. And so in this case, what you would do is you would simply just include the new line character. And then likewise with the first name and whether you choose to capitalize it or leave it as the variable uh, name is perfectly fine. It doesn't really matter at this point. And we have our first name and we simply go through each one of our fields, much like we did in our earlier examples. So this is not significantly different. However, though, what you'll see is that we can adapt this behavior now in our subclasses. So for the last field that I explicitly want to address in my user is going to be the status field and it's just simply going to be this dot status and also what you can do is you can actually specify the two string method here and if you'll note that with an enum it returns the name of this enum constant essentially it's the friendly name or you can just simply leave it as this dot status and if you notice here, you'll have a, you'll, you'll, you'll see what we get when we run this, you'll actually just get the friendly name, no other information that would be provided by the status enum two string method. Once again, we can play around with this in future videos. And then additionally, we simply want to add our new line. This, if this is going to be our last field, we're going to note, and you'll see why, that we may or may not wish to include new line. So optional new line. 
All right. Ah, yes. Okay. I was didn't catch. There we go. All right. Now let's spend a little bit more time on our user class before we jump over to our address class. Right now we're ignoring that address class, but we're going to come back to it in just a second. And that brings us to the third step that we need to address in each one of our classes and our subclasses. And that is how are we going to construct one of these users? And so to begin with, what we want to do is we want to think about what is the minimum amount of information that must be provided at the time we create the user object. Now, some of this is going to be debatable and some of this is going to be specific to a particular project. However, it is generally not a great idea to use a parameterless constructor. In other words, basically you just create the object and then later on you decide what you want to fill it with respect to its properties or how you want to fill it with respect to its properties. Once again, some projects might dictate that you do it this way. However, it is generally a good idea to identify with your constructors as many reasonable combinations of your arguments or of your attributes as makes sense. So for instance, if we were to create a user, we would hope that at the very least we have an ID. Or what we'll see later is that we can actually have a unique ID generator. And then also we may at the creation of the user at the time of creating the user, we may also have their first name and last name. So in this case, we could probably justify having at least two constructors. And that's where we're gonna start with. So once again, we're gonna try to avoid having our parameterless constructor. And what we'll do here is we will have a public user, and the idea here is that this user will be required, or this constructor will be required to accept an ID. And at that point, what it will do is it will simply set the ID based on whatever was passed to it. So in other words, we have our this.id equal to ID. For the remaining fields, what we can do is we can initialize them to default values. Now, the problem with this approach is it means that we're gonna run into a little bit of duplicate code. So what I'm going to do for just a second is I'm going to leave this constructor alone and I'm going to go ahead and start focusing on the constructor that accepts more parameters. So in this case, we'll have our public user string for the ID, string for the first name, string for the last name. And once again, we could include other fields, especially as we grow our user, but at the very least, we'll agree that this is a logical second constructor. And inside this constructor, we would also want to validate the data or validate the arguments. And I'm not going to do that here, but we need to start doing that in the future. Basically make sure that the ID is, for instance, not null, first name and last name are not null. They are all have length greater than zero. And also in the case of the ID, if you want it to be globally unique, you need to check to see what the other IDs are for your objects. Once again, we're not gonna cover that in this particular video. Instead, what we're going to assume is that these input arguments pass validation. At this point then, we go ahead and set this.id is equal to ID, this.firstName, is going to be equal to whatever was passed by first name. This dot last name is going to be equal to last name. And now we're gonna start running into a little bit of a quandary. 
what do we initialize our primary address to? Now, what I'm going to do temporarily is I'm going to leverage the fact that Java will allow for you to have a parameterless constructor by virtue of just forgetting to specify a constructor. In other words, if you notice over here in our address class, we've done nothing. There's no constructor, there's no attributes. However, what you will see is that you can simply say this dot primary address is equal to new ee333 dot address. We didn't specify a constructor, but you get one essentially for free. And we do want to put a little note here, probably need to change this later. Okay. And then lastly, what we want to do with this particular constructor is decide what will be the status of our object that we have just created. Once again, this is sort of a system status. This is not required necessarily by Java. But this sort of helps us make sure that our system is working well. In other words, if we create a user, are they active? Are they inactive? Are they unknown? And that becomes more of a question than of the behavior of your system. But at the very least, what we're going to do is we're going to set the default now, default status rather, equal to ee333.status.active. And so once again, this is open for discussion. Which brings us back to the earlier constructor. The earlier constructor was going to attempt to do the same thing. And we would simply follow this up with a first name equal to empty quotes and so on. But now you have a question of what do you want to do in each one of these constructors? So we could, for instance, finish this out as this dot last name equal to empty quotes, the this dot address or primary address equal to new ee333 dot address, as well as now the this dot status would likely not be active, but rather something along the lines of unknown. But then the question becomes we have, whether or not we want the duplicate code and also what type of behavior that we wish to have. So the question, for instance, do we want to create a user with three arguments and we validate the arguments to make sure that they are in fact legitimate, in other words, that the first name is not null or is greater than zero, the length is greater than zero. If we do that, however, we cannot have this constructor call the more involved constructors. So one option that we would have if we choose not to validate our arguments would be to simply call the this, I actually have to do it up here. And you can see that we can specify the ID. And what we would do is we would simply pass empty quotes for the first and last name. And so once again, depending on the system, this could be bad. Because essentially what happens here is that you initialize your first and last name to an empty string when in fact you had hoped to already have the first name and last name by virtue of calling this constructor. I'm just going to leave this here, but I'm actually going to comment it out. And the other thing to note briefly is the fact that your this indicates the constructor in this class, in this case, the overload or the constructor with three arguments. And the second thing to note is that it must be the first line of the constructor. So in other words, the first line of this constructor, if you intend to call another constructor, 
must be a call to that constructor. Now, we're gonna revisit this, so I'm just gonna throw that out there for you to understand that there are some different scenarios that we could deal with. Likewise, you could also do the same approach here by calling this, and if you'll notice now, I could actually use the earlier constructor to simply create my user object. And at that point then, I would actually no longer need to set the ID here because it effectively was set in the earlier, more primitive constructor. In other words, the simpler constructor. And this is an approach that I generally, generally try to use. Essentially what I do is I use one constructor or the one with the least features or the least input arguments to set the default and then go back in subsequent constructors that have more information and simply set the fields or the attributes that I now know about. So this is the approach that we're going to take. I wanted to show you this approach because it's also common and you'll actually see it in your textbooks as well as some examples on the Oracle website and in some of our examples. Now, most of this should be somewhat of a review. However, what we'd like to do now is we'd like to jump quickly over to our address. And we'd like to flush out at least a little bit of this class. And we'll start off with what makes an address. Well, it's going to be a series of strings typically. And in this case, what we'll do is we'll have one. The first one is going to be the street address. Um, perhaps we can also include the city. Uh, if we're gonna assume that we are here in the United States, probably something to consider then will be the state. And then the zip code, which uh, we can use an integer value. However, that's going to complicate things if we're storing the long version of the zip code. In other words, the 5-4 um, zip code, the full zip code. So in this case, we're also going to go ahead and use a string. You can also decide if you want the state to be the two letter abbreviation or the full name. But basically what we want to do here is we simply want to stub this out and add additional functionality as we see fit. So at the very least, we've got a street address, a city, a state, and a zip, which you would probably agree is a basic address. At this point, we can go to refactor and we can go to encapsulate fields. And I don't really see a reason at least not right now that we shouldn't just make this read and write available in other words everything has a getter and a setter we may come back and eliminate some of these later on but right now it doesn't seem like a bad idea now the next thing that we want to do is talk about constructors for this class and you would agree that you probably only have a scenario where you either know nothing about the address or you know everything about the address. Seldom, for instance, do you have a situation where someone knows their street address, but not the city, the state, and the zip. Although maybe there could be some strange situations. Or you have a situation where they know absolutely nothing about their address. Maybe they've just moved here and they need to get it to you. And your question you should be asking is, should that prevent us from creating the user? And the answer is probably not. So what we wanna do now is we wanna create two constructors here. This is one of those examples where we might can justify a parameterless constructor. And we'll simply have that be a public address. And at this point then, all we want to do inside this particular constructor is initialize all of our fields, all of our attributes. So this dot street address, this dot city, this dot state, and this dot zip. And note here, this is also a good example of where we could subsequently use our status enum once more. Once again, this part is a little bit optional, but if we were to include the status enum here, what this would allow for us to do 
is say that our status is in fact unknown, specifically unknown for our address. So in other words, it would allow for us to create a user that maybe they you had their ID, their first and last name, but you didn't actually have their address. And so at this point, then we can just specify that their address is in fact unknown. Hopefully you can quickly see where having a general purpose system enum is actually very, very useful in your application. It can help us in future logic. Now, as I mentioned, you probably have an all or nothing situation, so we should probably go ahead and create a, another address constructor. This one, of course, will have the string street address, string city, string state, and string zip. As before, we probably want to validate the data, but we're going to assume that the street address that was passed is in fact a valid street address. The this.city is equal to the city, this.state is equal to the state, and this.zip is going to be equal to the zip. At which point, if you assume that this passes validation, you can also go ahead and set the status here as active, or you could almost argue that we could use a different or better enum here, but active is general enough that it makes sense. So this is the active address. That doesn't sound unreasonable. But also a little bit of a comment here when it comes to validation. This is actually a great example of where you can do quite a bit of validation. Not only whether the string is null or whether it is length zero or the city is of length zero and so on, but you can actually validate the state against a list of states. You can also validate the zip possibly using, for instance, the US Postal Service's API so you've got a lot of options for validation. At this point, then your question becomes, is there any necessity at all to make a call to my parameterless constructor? Well, in this particular example, probably not because essentially we're covering our bases or we're covering each one of the attributes in both constructors. The only thing really left to do here at this point is now to simply create a two string. So I'm going to come down here to the bottom. I'm going to make a public two string, just like I did in the other example for our user. In this case, it's going to be a string. The name of the function is going to be two string. And at this point, we can go ahead and simply declare our output variable will initialize it to empty quotes we'll return our output and then what we can do is simply create a nice tabular format for our output and it probably wouldn't be a bad idea if you'd like it to look consistent to come borrow one of your earlier examples and what we're gonna do is we're simply gonna come back over here to our address here and change the field. So here's how I go about doing this to make this line up is I actually make two copies of it and I'll go through each one of the fields. And what you'll see here is that I can line up then my, uh, my uh, columns, rather my, my fields, based on a previous copy from a, another object. You'll see here, actually, it would benefit me a little bit to make this a little wider. I uh, probably made that just a little too narrow to begin with, so I'm gonna just go ahead and do that one more time. That allows for longer field names. And so in this case, then, it's going to be this dot street address. Our city 
our state. And then the zip code And then you can decide from here whether or not you wish to include the status, okay? So it might be valuable to include the status of your address as well as the status of your user. Now, the other thing to note here, and I didn't point it out in the earlier example because it is not absolutely essential, is that you, can, you need to add the at override annotation to any function that overrides a existing function in a parent class. So that's the warning that we were getting here. And so in this case, you'll want to do the same thing here. Basically, what that does is that emphasizes that the two string that is in this object should essentially override what would be in the parent class. This will make more sense when we start looking to our subclasses and actually creating custom methods in subclasses that override the parent classes methods. But at this point, we should have our address worked out, at which point then you can come back over here to our user.java and at least know that our constructor will in fact do something. Earlier, the constructor didn't do anything because we hadn't written any code for it. We were just leveraging the default constructor that was created by Java. We still probably need to work on this, but effectively, the only way for us to get any information to the address constructor would be to add additional parameters in our user constructor. And that's probably not what we want to go about doing. However, there will be scenarios where you may want to consider passing additional fields or additional arguments, as well as possibly passing an entire address object. Now, what I'd like to do is see how this relates to our subclasses. So far, all we've done is focused on one class, our user class, and haven't really looked at any of the subclasses. And so for the remainder of this video, what I'd like to do is I'd like to fix some of the errors that you're seeing. And more importantly, as I'd like to add something to our employee class to sort of justify its existence, if nothing else. And so you'll notice that as we started working on our user class, we started getting red in the immediate subclasses that inherited or extended our user class. And particularly, you'll see that we're getting a warning that says no suitable constructor was found for user. Remember once again that Java creates a parameterless constructor by default. Our user constructor, or excuse me, our user class does not, in fact, have a parameterless constructor because we made the decision that it shouldn't. So as a result, we have to have a constructor that accepts an input argument in each one of the subclasses that directly inherits from our user class. And specifically, we need to have a constructor that accepts an ID. And so to fix this problem, what we're going to do is we're simply going to create a public constructor. We're going to, of course, call it employee, and it must accept a string ID. And at this point, then, what we want to do, you're going to get another warning, that means won't leave you alone until you do this, is that you have to make sure and make a call then to that parent constructor. Okay, so in other words, to be able to create an employee from a user, we have to make a call to that parent class, or we should make a call to that parent class. 
So we now have a constructor for our employee that accepts an ID, but our red didn't go away. The warnings and the errors did in fact not go away. So what's the problem? As a matter of fact, you'll see it almost looks as if the problem got worse. And the problem is that we are not yet leveraging that constructor that's associated with the parent class. And so for instance, if you recall that we had a user constructor that accept a single input argument and it initializes all of the underlying fields, but we aren't leveraging that here. How do we in fact leverage it? Well, there's another keyword similar in concept to the this keyword called the super keyword. So in this case, super will make a call to or indicate a call to our parent class. And in this case, what we'll do is we will make a call to the constructor, super constructor that accepts a single input argument, in this case, the ID. And so now what will happen is this will call our user class, the constructor for our user class, and it will set the first name, last name, the primary address, and the status for our newly created employee. Now, the idea here is that we could also do this for other constructors for an employee, but we'll come back to that in just a second. What we want to do is make sure we understand what has happened and why we now appear to have a cascade of errors. So notice here now that I have an error in my university employee and my hospital employee. Well, the error that I'm getting is actually the same one that I got when I did not have the constructor for the employee in that it expects a single input argument. In this case, what we want to do is we want to also have a super, sorry, I didn't create my constructor yet. So we have a public university employee. <clears throat> and in this case, what we'll do is we'll make a call to the university employee's parent class. And you'll see that that constructor also accepts an ID. So in this case, what we're doing here is our university employee constructor is calling our employee constructor and we're passing an ID as the singular input argument. At this point, you'll notice that I now have read in the faculty and in the staff and we still have yet to fix the hospital employee. So let's go ahead and do that as well. So we'll create the constructor for the hospital employee and string ID, and then simply make the call to super passing the ID and the hospital employee constructor calls the employee constructor, the employee constructor calls the user constructor. And at this point, I think you've probably figured out the pattern such that every one of our subclasses needs to address the fact that it does not have a default constructor. And in this case, for our faculty then, the string ID, and then once again, super, we're gonna pass the ID. Likewise with our staff, so we'll have public staff. Accept a string ID. And once again, make a call to super. And the staff then of course, we'll call the university employee, the university employee calls the employee, the employee calls the user constructor. Same on the hospital side. 
the doctor constructor. accepts a string ID and it will simply make a call to its parent class constructor as well as the nurse Now, we've got quite a few of these to fix at this point. Still, we also have our patient, although it's not nested quite as deep. We still have to do the same thing here. So our public patient. And at this point, you could probably get into the habit of just simply going ahead and copying and pasting a little bit. So in this case, I'm going to have a public inpatient and a public outpatient. And the same problem with our student. And now our undergraduate and our graduate student. And then lastly, our volunteer. Now, fortunately, as we said earlier, our volunteer doesn't have any subclasses, so we don't have quite as much work to do here. But at this point now, we should once again be back to error-free code. And more importantly, if we focus on our employee path or employee hierarchy, you should appreciate now that if we were to, for instance, create a nurse, it would require that the nurse has an ID by virtue of the fact that a hospital employee has to have an ID, which by virtue of the fact that the employee has to have an ID, and then ultimately that the user has an ID. So this is a great demonstration now of the hierarchy of our constructors. The last thing that I wanna cover in this introductory video is simply leveraging now our to string. And particularly what I want to do is I want to go back once again to our user.java because we didn't fully handle the to string there. And so to see what I mean, if you notice here, we have our first name, last name, and status, but we completely ignored our primary address. And so what I'd like to do now is I'd like to go ahead and add a the ability now to get the information about the primary address and to sort of make it look seamless with respect to our two string in our user. And to accomplish that, I simply say output plus equal this dot primary address dot two string. And now what I'm going to do is I'm essentially going to call the two string method of my primary address to fill in the gaps about things like the street address, the city, the state, etc. Now, what I'd also like to do is to focus on my two string in my employee.java and specifically in my employee class. Now, we'll ultimately go through and we will add functionality in each one of these classes but to emphasize the difference between an employee and perhaps a student, we would need to add an additional field. And we said earlier that that likely would be something like a salary. And so we'll start off with it being an int and we'll call it salary. At this point, you can go ahead and manually write the getters and the setters, or you can just simply go to refactor and encapsulate fields. In this case, we want to have both a getter and a setter and refactor. 
And then what we would like to do now is we would like to have our two string reflect that we are handling the salary. So for instance, the public string two string, and we could, for instance, go ahead and rewrite the entire two string that was ultimately in our user.java, or what we can do is simply append the additional information. So understand what I'm talking about here. I'm going to go ahead and create my temporary variable, my output. I'm going to return output. And notice also that I'm getting the warning about the override. So I'm going to go ahead and add the override. And at this point then, we have to ask our question, should we recreate the two string or borrow from the parent? Well, if we want to borrow from the parent, then what we can do here is we can call the super dot two string, which will effectively leverage the two string from the parent. And we will simply assign then the output from that function to our output temporary variable. At that point, then, the only thing we need to do is we simply add on to that output the information about the salary. And once again, it would probably not be a bad idea for us to come back over here to our user Java and simply borrow one of our lines just for the purposes of keeping the spacing consistent. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to just temporarily copy that in there and once again, line it up nicely. And then we can say this dot salary. And then we can add a new line onto that optionally. And just a little minor note here, since salary is an integer, we probably ought to go ahead and leverage then the tools associated with an integer. And particularly, you have the ability to take an integer and convert it to a string. And so in this case, you'll see that NetBeans is actually helping us out because it identified that the likely integer that we want to convert is going to be the salary. And at this point, then you can guarantee that you aren't going to have any conversion issues. Now, before we finish this off, you should have a red flag in your mind. In other words, there should be a problem that we haven't yet discussed. And that is that I added my field for salary, which was not part of the employee, but I have not initialized it. And so the question becomes, where do I initialize this? Well, after we make a call to super with the ID, all of the fields associated with the user class, or specifically the instance of the user class or our user object, have now been initialized. The only one left to do is the this.salary. So at this point, then we're just going to initialize the salary as zero. This gives us a great opportunity to also take a look at what is available to our subclass. And if you note, none of the variables that you saw in our user class are available to the subclass directly. And the reason for that being is that we have declared them private. So you'll see that there are in fact no references to this.id, this.first name, and so on, because the behavior to control these is handled in the user by virtue of the getters and the setters. Now we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about this, so don't worry about this yet. Effectively, what you wanna do is just note that because it's private to the user, I simply can't see it. 
Which brings us to one final point for this video, and that is we probably should go ahead and consider including another constructor. And that is simply the one that matches the user constructor with the first name, last name, and the ID. Now, you could argue that you could also go ahead and use another constructor that would, for instance, accept the additional information of the salary if you had that at the time when you created the employee. And once again, you're getting an error that says that you have not yet called your parent constructor. And so in this case, then, we simply say super and we pass the ID, the first name, and the last name. And just like before, we can have a discussion about whether one constructor in the employee class should call another. But once again, that is a discussion for a later video. Hopefully you found this video useful. As always, if you have any questions or comments, don't hesitate to ask or email me. And thank you for watching.